just going to use this one right here, Charlie. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all are? Y'all understand that? How y'all are? Y'all all right? What a great day. What a great debate. What a great day to have church today, huh? What well, a great day to have church. I tell you, praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be here. We have a few announcements. If you've got your bulletins and everything, I want you to look in there. There's several different things that are coming up. Uh, you'll see in there... Um, the, house, the Southwest Home Service is in need of some new or gently used backpacks. Now, this will help some uh, children all around our community and stuff that maybe don't have the funds, their parents don't have the funds to be able to get backpacks, school supplies. If you're able or you want to participate in that, you'll see uh, all that listed in here. Also, uh, tonight, uh, Kim's going to tell about her uh, New Hope uh, summer camp that she attended. So I want you all to remember her and your prayers. Also, Christy, where are you at? Christy, we're going to do that. We're doing that tonight, right, Andrew? What you tell me? Um, tonight, until, until, <laughs> let me surprise this brother Raymond. Don't look surprised, Raymond. <laughs> we're going to have the, the little ones do some music tonight. You good with that? I knew you was okay with that. We, we prepare all this. To, uh, we, we just want to praise the Lord. What about y'all? I don't know about y'all, but I came here to praise the Lord. So I want you to remember all our youngins. How many kids are we going to have, Christy? They're going to talk, well, they're, they're going to sing and everything. Y'all come support them kids. What a wonderful time. They're going to come sing the, the worship they learned and everything. What a fabulous, what a fabulous thing. So y'all remember them in your prayers tonight. Also, let's see, what else we got? Got any other announcements? Richard, when's that Hunter thing? August the 27th. August the 27th, we're going to have, uh, uh, what do you call that, Hunter Safety? Yeah, uh, Hunter Education. Hunter Education, August 27th, we're going to have Hunter Education. If you don't have your Hunter Education, you ain't, and you ain't been trained up or nothing like that, uh, y'all get signed up on that. Where do they sign up on that at? So it'll be online in the back. There's some information right there in the back. Uh, y'all get some of that information, and uh, y'all attend that, so y'all can go hunting with your family, all right? I think everybody gets a, what, a free headlighter? No, I don't kid. I'm joking. That's a Livingston Parish joke. Y'all ain't going to catch that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's is that all the answers we got? We have, uh, we have several people I want you to remember. You know, Miss Mary Reeves, uh, she has been in isolation now, but she can talk on the phone just fine, guys. And, uh, but she's still in isolation. She had to go to the hospital last night. Remember her in your prayers. Uh, my wife uh, got sick last night. Several people got sick last night. And uh, so y'all just keep them on in your prayers, okay? Good. All right. Well, I tell you what, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? We kind of kinda come unprepared today. We're going to, uh, before we get started in our regular mm -hmm. service, we're going to, today is a, well, this is a new month, so we always sing happy birthday to anyone that's got a birthday in the month of August. So if you got a birthday in August, we want you to stand up. We're going to sing happy birthday to you, okay? Birthdays in August. One in the choir. They all remain standing now. We're going to sing happy birthday to you. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm standing. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. I tell you what, I'm so excited this morning, I don't know what to do. I got, I got my grandchildren here and my great-grandchildren here, and I'm so glad that they're here. Uh, we're just looking forward to visiting with them today, and it's great, great, great to be in the church this morning, isn't it? Let's all stand together and, and sing this song, and y'all Come on and let's sing it like you're. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> Let's stand together. 
I'm a two, holy, holy, holy. in prayer at this time. Amen. Blessed Redeemer, up Calvary's mountain, one dreaded morning.
think all of you gone to sleep now. We're going to wake up on this next song. When the morning comes, y'all come on and join with a sing. A lot of you are not even tempting to sing. If you can't sing, open your mouth anyway. All right? When the morning comes, this will be our offertory hymn. I want you to stand with us as we sing. Number 522. thank you for allowing us to come back to your house this morning to worship you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given us this past week, for keeping us safe, Lord, from harm and danger. Lord, we love you so much. We just thank you for the blessings that you give us from day to day. Lord, I pray that you would bless our church, continue to bless us, Lord, as we strive to serve you here in this community. Lord, we can reach out and touch this ones that's lost, Lord, and bring them to you before it's too late. Go with us now through this service. Lead God and direct us, Lord. Forgive us where we've failed you. For these things I ask in your name. Amen. <coughs>
I'm trying to do a song this morning. I'm, I got one side stopped up, and this here is kind of crunchy this morning, so I don't know whether I get the song out or not, but we're going to try it. It's, uh, it's a great song. It's got a great message in it. It's one of my wife's favorite songs. She's always asking me to sing this, and this is our 57 anniversary this month and she's got all her little kids grandkids and great grandkids with her this morning she's just sitting on cloud nine amen this is entitled the lighthouse listen to the words and the message in it For 
Christians in this place? Good, this sermon's for y'all. God has been very good to us, and uh, we just praise his holy name. You know, one of the exciting things for a pastor to see is all these babies. I love to see everybody, so don't misinterpret that. But you know, one of the things people are telling us is that the church is dead. And the reason people suffer so much is because they don't bring their children to church anymore. They don't keep teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what you're doing is you're making an eternal difference in your family's life as you bring and teach them the ways of Christ. If you'll open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and then we're going to look at 1 John chapter 2. Brother Raymond, that was a perfect song. You know, uh, we took a couple days, me and my family, and we went to a place called Grand Isle. Any of y'all know where Grand Isle is? Alan, I know you know Grand Isle is. You probably live down there, Grand Isle. Grand Isle is uh, it's a barrier island. It's the only occupied, uh, populated barrier island in the state of Louisiana. I've been going there since I was a little kid. And where I stayed at, <laughs> I stayed at the First Baptist Church of Grand Isle. And what's so interesting about that location is that it, it used to be a booming place back in the 1980s, early 80s. It used to have a large population of people there. It's only about 1,000 who stay there now live there the rest of it is camps and like they have the Grand Isle Tarpon Rodeo there's over 10,000 people that would come through there um, it's about 99.9999% Catholic and that little church was there it, it used to run around 150 120 to 150 every Sunday now it's running between 20 and 30 people every Sunday uh, there's still a population down there but it's very hard to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know with that population of just 20 or 30, uh, they're, they're basically what you call, it's, see, what's the name of that? It's a, it's a resort ministry is the way they, they define it now. They also have a satellite church, a, a church plant that's in Fushan, and the Fushan church plant is actually all larger than the one in Grand Isle. But what, was, what I was watching was how they, they had six vacation Bible schools this year. And, of course, that's reaching into not only the community, but all those who are coming down there just to fish and everything. One of those most important things they do, though, is they stay solid in doing and knowing what they're trying to do. Uh, their church is basically the lighthouse. It's a lighthouse where they uh, go and they spread the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There's not a lot of money in their church. There's not a lot of different things. Of um, They have a large property with a lot of overhead but they are consistent in doing what they're called to do. And that's what's important. Consistency in teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you can stand with me as we read God's holy word this morning. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I read this scripture a lot, but we're going to read it again. <laughs> so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. If you'll look at 1 John chapter 2 now, 1 John chapter 2, that's towards the back. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 1. First John chapter 2. 
Look at verse 1. It says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate which, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of the God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Let's use that as our opening scriptures today. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask God. We ask God that you would speak to our hearts. For Lord, we come here to seek you. We've come here, God, to learn more about you. Lord, many claim to be Christians here, and I pray, Father, that their hearts would be open to the word, the message, Father, and that they would go out with gladness. Lord, we didn't come in here just to come around and just sing hymns. Lord, we come to praise, to worship, to exalt, to study you. So, Lord, we know that your word will be fulfilled in us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. Now, several years ago, we went to youth camp just a few months ago right here. But I, I got to thinking while I was down there at Grand Isle about just what happened several years ago in the ministry where me and Ted was at a church. And uh, we were taking a youth group down uh, to a, a location uh, not far from where we were at with the, the last youth group. And in this location, was we were studying and, and, and seeking God's will in our lives. One of the amazing things that took place was a transformation that happened in the lives of the youth and the lives of the adult that were chaperoning this particular event. Now, when you go to a youth camp, most times it's, you know, we, we try to center that upon reaching and teaching the youth. But if you ever go to a youth camp, you're going to be blessed too because the gospel is presented and the praise and worship's there. Now, one of the things that was taking place at this particular camp was people started confessing their faults one to another. Now, what's so interesting, because we don't like to expose ourselves. We don't ever expose ourselves or our weaknesses or places that we're just not where we should be. We want everybody to see us in our suits or ties or whatever clothes that we wear. And we, we want them to see the, see the shiny outside of us and not know our interior. But the one thing is, God knows about our hearts. He knows the bad, the good. He knows all the in-betweens right there. He knows my faults my imperfections, and he says, I can help you, and I can change you. As these youth were at this particular meeting, and as they were preaching and hearing the gospel message, the Holy Spirit was stirring hearts so much that they said, you know what? We've got to change things in our lives. We have to get things right with Christ. Now, it, it was very exciting because the adults were being stirred in their hearts also. We had a, a man that was there with me, and this man, he was, he was right there at 90 years old. He was like 88 years old. Now, I didn't know how an 88-year-old was going to react when they had praise and worship music uh, that was for the youth group. And so I didn't know how he was going to respond. But this guy was so fired up because he says, you know, we have got to change how we're doing ministry. We've got to look for these lost people. We've got to be out there teaching and reaching. Now, I thought the guy was going to, like, throw me out when he heard some of this some of the singing and everything. You know, it, was, it was mild, but I knew it wasn't the traditional songs that we had been raised with. And it was still the gospel message. And it spoke to his heart. And as he's seen the youth responding to the Holy Spirit, it transformed him. It transformed his life because he says, Lord, I got things in my life that aren't right either. I have things that I need to get rid of. Now, can you imagine someone in that particular age group who still had difficulties? Who still knew that there was things that were keeping him from being as close to Christ as he should be. Now, when our youth group got back and they started giving their testimonies at the church, one of the things that kind of shocked me was I heard this lady come up and say, well, I hope that keeps them youth pumped up for a while. And I know she had good intentions when she was saying it, but I got to pondering that statement. I hope that keeps them pumped up for a while. That's an emotional statement, meaning that they went through just an emotional time. Now, I know she probably didn't mean it that way, but that's the words that were spoken. And through the years, I've heard several people make that statement. 
Now, I used to have some tires on an old truck, and they would be slow leakers. Anybody have a slow leaker tire? And that tire, I'd always have to go get that thing aired up. But you know, when I got that thing fixed, what happened? It quit leaking. It quit leaking out the air. Let me tell you, we don't need people to stay pumped up. We need to get them transformed by the Holy Spirit that their lives will be changed. Their mindset will be changed. The way they look at ministry, the way they, they walk in their faith, it'll be changed because it has been sealed up by the power of God himself. A lot of times as adults, so we look at things and we say, well, you know, that's good for the youth. I'm so glad that they are changing and being transformed because, you know, they have so much in their lives they need to get fixed. But we don't look at ourselves. A lot of times we, we don't look in that mirror of, of, of the Holy Word and see it being focused at us and saying, you know what, there's things that, that are holding me back. What an adult will say is, you know what, I'm not under the bondage of the law, so I can do what I want. So in other words, what we're saying is like what Paul talked about, you know, do I sin more that grace might abound more? Is that what we're saying? Do we say that so, you know, I can go and lo do and, and live the way I want and claim that I'm a child of God, a Christian, a born-again believer, and do what I want to do? What you're seeing, though, when you do that is hindrances to your walk with Christ. What you're seeing is things that are keeping you from being who you should be. Now, what happened with our youth group at that time, this is years ago, just remember it wasn't at this church, this was at another church, they had a bonfire. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a youth bonfire. But the youth took the things that they felt were hindering their walks with Christ, and they burned it. The CDs. How much y'all pay for them CD things? How much of them things? $15? Man, you must be crazy. <laughs> they burned CDs. <laughs> they burned clothes. I want you to listen. No one told them. No one suggested it. They went out there. They said, these things are keeping us from being closer to Christ. Now, what got me, though, was some of the adults saying, oh, my goodness, they're burning up all them CDs. I mean, we could sell them at least and recoup some of our money. In other words, we could pass on what our children has to somebody else, and at least we could recoup some of our money. See, what happens a lot of times is we don't think how it affects other people. We don't think about the things in our lives that hinder in us and how it affects our witness and our testimony. And sometimes we get focused. I could have been just as bad. I could say, oh, my goodness. I mean, literally, I was trying to remember how much was in there, but I imagine at $15 a piece, the fire was up. It was a big old pile like this, and they literally burned it. So I imagine it was around 1000 or dollars or so with different things. But they said, this is what's keeping me from being who I should be. A lot of times in our lives, we're taking a Christian sabbatical. And what we do is a, a sabbatical is when somebody takes off some time so they can recoup or get refocused on the plan or the mission. And that's in the secular world. And I know in Livingston Parish, a teacher every 10 years is able to take off a whole year for a sabbatical that's paid. But when Christians take sabbaticals, we step back from our Christian faith and our Christian walk, and we say, you know what, I just don't need to be there right now. I, I'm just not going to follow those rules. I'm not going to follow those directions. I, you know, I got so much in my life right now that is so important, and I'm sure God doesn't mind that. So what I want to do is just take a couple things, uh, just to look at some of the aspects dealing with our Christian walk. Now, one of the things I, I believe that we need to look at is when you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1, this is what it says. It says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So here's what we need to ask ourselves as born-again believers. Do we live a disciplined life? See, first, we've we got to understand what disciplined life is in the first place. So the words, when we look at living sacrifice, that, that describes a Christian life. It's, a, it's discipline, and it's in our daily walk of under the control of Christ. Now, where it comes from, it comes back from the, the, the background of the sacrificial system used in, in, the, in, the, in the temple at that time. Now, that word, when we look at this right here, you look at that word present, it's a technical term. 
And what it's describing means to presenting a Levitical offering. So what do you need to present a little Levitical offering? First, you've got to have a priest. You've got to have an altar. You've got to have a sacrificial animal, that perfect animal. So today, it's not required that we have to go out there today and find sheep and calves and doves and, and all these animals because Jesus Christ is the perfect offering. So here's, so what do, we, what do we present to God? What do we bring as our offering now, New Testament? Well, we bring ourselves. See, we're the priest. So we're the priest. Jesus Christ is the altar, and our lives are the sacrifice that we lay upon the altar. We present ourselves. So how do we present ourselves? We present ourselves in death. No, I'm not talking about going out there and killing ourselves. I'm talking about we die to ourselves. We die to our goals. We, got, we die to everything that keeps me away from the glory of Christ. We're no longer conforming to what the world says is natural. We're no longer listening to the things that the world says, well, this is what you've got to do. If you're going to be cool, if you're going to be the example, this is how you should be. And Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 it talks about taking up our cross. It says, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. That's the hardest thing to do is to deny myself, to deny myself of anything. And it says, and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's from Jesus Christ. So taking up my cross means death to my sinful ways, death to my ways that are not the example to others, death to the ways that are destructive. So have you built an altar in your life? When you look at your life, have you built one? Have you put yourself up on the altar? The disciplined life does that. The life that wants to grow closer to Christ throws itself up on the altar and says, Lord, have thy way, not mine. I want your way, Lord. I want to do your service, Father. I want to follow your example, Father. I want to be a missionary in my community for your glory, Lord. See, a disciplined life, it, it, it has a, a sound judgment. It, it, it thinks soberly. When you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a, a measure of faith. Sound judgment, it talks about soberly in some of your different Bibles. So that sober means a self-controlled, disciplined life. The world says you've got to get out here and get crazy, get stupid, destructive. It, it's fun to be a Christian. It's fun to go out there, and, and we can have good times. We had one other night, and we had Christian music going, and they were slipping and sliding and jumping and, and going all over the place. There was no drinking going on. There was no uh, vulgar activities taking place, but there was lots of laughter. There was lots of joy, and there was lots of peace. See, a disciplined mind, what it does, it governs all its passions that the world says, you know what, you want to go look at dirty pictures on your cell phone or something like that? It's okay, it's your business, right? You're not hurting nobody. You want to go over here and you want to consume things to, to uh, over and above or where you're a drunkard or something like that? You're all right because you're doing it in the safety of your home. The believer becomes conformed to the mind of Christ by saying, have your will, God. It's not about me. It's not about my desires. It's not about my pleasures. It's all about you serving you. See, there's so much more to Christianity than just coming up here and getting a dip in a water hole. See, we're to have disciplined thoughts about myself. If we think too highly of ourselves, if we think too highly of just this individual, it, it, we're, we're going around so proud that we say, you know what, I can do anything I want to do, how I want to do it. I, I, I've made the money myself, and I'm able to do it. And what happens is we become so self-absorbed that we don't care about doing anything. We claim Christ, but what are we doing for the glory of Christ? It says in Scripture that we're to be disciplined, sober, humble, and a surrendered attitude for the glory of Christ. Now, the youth that, that I was talking about earlier, they had surrendered attitude by admitting they had things that were distracting them from God. They had things that were distracting them from their walk with Christ. They had things that were, listen, being a Christian is more than just having a little cross on your chest. 
a little cross hanging in your window or on your bumper sticker or something like that. Being a Christian is someone who cares about how they're doing it and why they're doing it. I wonder if uh, us adults, if, if us as parents, if we ever came to that same conclusion that there's things that's distracting me and keeping me from where I should be in Christ, if we would be willing to put it down. I wonder if we would be willing to put our music down. I wonder if we would be willing to turn off those stations that are ugly or showing vulgar things right there. What has happened is we've become so callous to it that we don't even think nothing of it, and our kids are sitting there watching it with us. See, our lifestyle does matter. Your music, it does matter. The television, it matters. Here's something else. Your friends matter, and it shows off who you truly are in your heart, who you are in Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, this talks about that yoke. It says, take my yoke. Now, I know a lot of people don't know about the yoke, but some of you have. I know y'all have had uh, years ago, y'all probably worked with mules or you worked with oxen or something like this. And they would take this, this yoke and they would bind two animals together. That way they were able to go out there and pull. So it says, take my yoke up upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, disciples... What we do is we learn from somebody else. We learn from another individual. And what happens is, is we adhere to, to the teacher of what their belief is, and, and we follow their teachings. That's why it's so important when your kids go to college, when their kids go into the schools, of what they're being taught, because they're going to follow the direction. And why the liberals have been going and taking over our college campuses and, and taking over the education system altogether is because they want to plant in their minds that everything that the Bible says is wrong is actually okay. That's why you see so many Christians that are okay with abortion today. That's right. People who claim to be Christians are okay with abortion. That's why you see Christians that are going up and you actually see preachers that are coming up and saying homosexuality is okay as long as they love each other. It's not. See, it's against God's will. And the disciples of Christ must learn the Word of God to be able to show forth why they believe what they believe in. So we're, we're to be yoked with Jesus Christ. That yoke symbolizes that submission. See, two, two oxen or two horses can pull together stronger than just one by itself. So when we submit our lives to Christ and we take His yoke upon us, it says that it's something that's easy. In other words, it makes my life uh, easier to live. I know the rights and the wrongs. I know what God's will is. I don't have to speculate because I'm adhering to what God has instructed me to do. So there's three words that are involved in the kind of submission right here. And one of the things is when you look at this, this yoke, one thing is this control. The discipline of life is under the control of Christ. And when you're under control of Christ, I take the word of God and I apply. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. All right? It's more than me just speaking out, I love Jesus, yes I do. It's I'm doing his will for my life. The disciplined person is somebody who's meek also. See, it's pictured like when you take a wild horse and you go out there and that wild horse, we, we had the horse ministry out here, and that man he took and he broke that horse where he was able to, to ride that horse. Now when he bro breaks that horse, he takes and he feeds it. He takes care of it. He grooms it. He makes sure its needs are met. He makes sure it has clean water. It has all the food that it needs. Here's the same thing. See, we're under the control of Christ. He says, I want to bless you. I, I don't want to keep you from things. <laughs> I'm going to keep you from things that are destructive in your lives. The reason they have the Bible, the, the, the road map, is to keep us from those things that are harmful, those things that are hurtful to us. See, Jesus' life, his life was perfectly disciplined, and he was, under, you know, he was seeking to do the Father's will. He was going to do his Father's will. As Jesus was to his Father, we're to be to him, under his control, seeking his, thy will, Lord. See, it's one thing when we, we sing that altar call song, we say, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Mold me and make me. I am the clay. When Christ, we, we let him come in, he takes control of his life. And we're constantly, it's not that I turn him off 
on, you know, like Friday night and Saturday night and turning back on on Sunday morning and stuff like this. I'm under the control of Christ, and as long as I'm under his control, I'm following his will. See, we've got to be, strive to be consistent. So there's lots of things in school. They, they, get out, they give out awards of consistency. You know, this individual has never missed a day of school. I promise you, I was never that particular individual or nothing like that. But they give out those kind of things. Consistent with God is consistent in his worship, consistent in his praise, consistent in serving him, consistent in, in making sure that the things I say, the things I do, are glorifying to Christ. That's a discipline life. That's self-control. That's that control uh, by the power of God right there. See, as I allow him, he trains me to do his work. Now, when I was a kid, my uncle had an Irish setter, a beautiful animal. I loved to watch it. And this, this dog was trained to be a quail dog. So he'd go out there, and he'd have the most beautiful points. And, boy, he'd get out there, and then, you know, the birds would flush up, and we'd shoot them. But the thing was, every now and then, he would go back to his old nature. And his old nature was, ah, I ain't going to wait for the hunters to get around here. And he would just jump in the middle of the covey and make them flush wild. And then if we shot some down, sometimes he'd say, ah, I think they can spare a couple of them. And he'd go over there and he'd swallow some of those quails. A lot of times we're like that dog. Uh, we get out here and we say, ah, it's okay if I just do things wildly today. It's okay if I, I go out here and I'm destructive and I'm not listening to the master because I'm only doing it every now and then. But what it does, it affects those around you. You want to know what's happening to the next generation, to the generations that are following us, is they see what really matters to you. If I was to, you know, sit down and we're asking, and I'm talking about not on Sunday morning, nothing like that. We just go in the middle of the week, and I ask them, what's important to your family? What really matters? They're going to tell me what really matters in your life. In my, on my wall in my office in there, you're going to see on there, they have a, a little statement of this, this boy right now. He's like, so he just got his driver's license. He's 16. But you go in my office. It's from when he was real little, and he was learning how to write. And the teachers asked them what they did for the summer. And he said, my daddy taught Sunday school. My mama worked at the church in the office. We go to church. We praise the Lord. We love God. And that's what he turned in as his summer mission and everything. And no one, it was, it's all spelled in Chris. He's phonetically spelling it and everything. But I thought it was such a beautiful message because it truly shared what his mom and dad has done for years. His dad, the Lord called his dad home at an early age when he was like 9, 10 years old. His dad went to be with Jesus, and he had a massive heart attack. But when he closed his eyes here, he opened his eyes to be in heaven. And his child is following the example of his dad today by serving the Lord. And he still holds that up as important. See, we're the living sacrifice. We, we are, we're laying ourselves at the altar saying, Lord, this is all about you. The third word is just completeness. When we look at the seat, the word involved in this, all life is under that Christ control. It's the total discipline that Christ demands, not partial he says, he says, you're either hot or you're, you're lukewarm. So if you analyze yourself, uh, you say, well, am I hot for Christ or am I lukewarm? Now, most people will spew out that lukewarm coffee. They either want it cold or they want it hot. They don't want the lukewarm stuff. They'll even go over there and put it in the microwave. Some of us need to be put back under that presence of God, under that control of Christ, so that we're no longer just staying out there lukewarm. So there's some scriptures that answer some of these questions right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. Look at what this says. 2 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read this to you. 2 Corinthians 10. <laughs> Did I not give that one to you, Jerry? That's okay. That's all right. That's I give him like 50,000 scriptures, and I left one out. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Pastoral mistake. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely uh, powerful for the destruction of the fortresses. We are destroying speculations in every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
It's just saying, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, this is what it says. It says, we're to give account of every single idle word that comes out of my mouth. You ever just go out there and, you know, like when you're not around here, you just cuss a little bit. Does it really matter? But he answered and he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. When we look at this, it says that we are under the control of Christ. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it talks about taking up your cross. Now, when you say that, it says, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And everything, everything were to give thanks to God. Everything were to give glory to God. Everything is supposed to be for the focus of Christ. So our lives is to be under his control. He's to be the center of our goals. He's to be the center of our focus. He's to be the center of our family. Now, some of you think that's extreme because you haven't heard of that. You say, well, I just don't know about that kind of religion. Well, it's not about religion. It's about the relationship. Do you want your husband or wife to be fully your husband or wife? Or do you want to share them with everybody around? not too comforting to think about that is it see we're christ and christ alone so do you know the fruits of a disciplined life let me let me get through this it says the roots of a disciplined life is is evidenced in the fruits that the, uh, my life produces so if i'm coming to your life what are the fruits that your life are producing for the glory of christ you got to ask yourself that question. How disciplined is your attitude towards yourself? Do you think too highly of yourself? Do you think you're really all that? How is your life disciplined towards your attitude towards God? And what about others? Do you have the love for God? Now, how can you have the love for God if you don't even have love for your neighbors? Do you, have, do you love your neighbor so much? Do you, do you care for him? Christ says, if, if, you, should love your, if you love him, you're going to love your neighbor. How disciplined are the words that come out your mouth? In Psalm 19, verse 14, Psalm 19, verse 14, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight to the Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So, are the words that come out your mouth and the things that you meditate on and that, that come out of your heart, are they acceptable to God Almighty? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So when we're going out there, there's no accidents of saying things. People have these problems. We justify our behavior by saying it's okay. So how disciplined are our morals? I mean, can, I, can, can Christ sit with you and watch TV? How would he like it going down the road in your car listening to your radio? <laughs> See, it's not about this. This church is just a structure. You're the church of Christ. If you're a born-again believer, we said we teach our babies very young age. Christ lives here, right? So we're going down the road, and what is Christ hearing going down the road in our vehicles? Adults always say, I'm not under the bondage of the law. I'm not under the bondage of the law. What we're actually saying, I'm going to do it my way, and I don't care what you want. I don't care what you like. And we spit in the eyes of Christ. Have you ever thought about how disciplined your worship is? You see, discipline means that I know where I should be at when I should be there. It says in Psalms 100 verse 4, it talks about entering his gates with praises. A lot of times, you know, when we come into the church, I mean, do we come up excited about having to be in church and serve the Lord? Or are we coming kind of like, oh my goodness, I'm here. My mama told me to be here. My daddy's there. My mama's there. My papa's there. Oh, Oh, and you see my mom and papa, <laughs> and you sit there, if this dude had just shut up, I'll go to sleep. Please, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembly of yourself together. And see, that's one of the things. We claim to be Christian, but we don't ever do what it says because we don't go, we don't have that habit of attending the church. We don't have a habit of going and praising the name of Jesus Christ. It's not going to affect me. It affects our walks with Christ because we're taking this time off saying it doesn't matter. How disciplined are you the grace of giving? Uh, no, if you're not a born-again believer, this ain't going to matter to you in the first place. And if you're not a member here, you can tune this out. Is giving a grace that you experience or a task that you endure? Every time you put that money in the plate, you're like, oh, my goodness. You know I could have had such and such with that. See, what happens is, is we forget that God has blessed us with everything that we possess. 
We're very blessed in this church. But here's the thing. How blessed are you? Jesus says, give and it shall be given unto you. In other words, I can't outgive God. So how disciplined are you in your devotional life? Am, am I praying? Am I reading the Bible? Am I, am I, listen, how much time, if there was a timer on your Facebook or on your computer, and we looked at the hours you spent on Facebook, how much does that compare in your prayer and in your Bible study? Are they pretty close? Are they pretty close? See, <laughs> a lot of times we forget. We say we don't have time but, you know, my wife set up that goofy phone of mine. I'm not real computer lit. And it's always going ding, 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 ding. I said, what is that? She says, that means you're getting this instant messenger. I said, what's an instant messenger? That's somebody trying to talk to you. I said, well, what they want to talk about? I'm busy. You see, we get so busy looking at this stuff and looking at little clue things that we never take the time to say, Lord... I love you. I thank you for my blessings in my life, for my family, for my home, for my salvation. Lord, I just want to praise you today, God. I don't know all the words. I don't know all them fancy things. I just want to say I love you, Lord. I just want to praise you. Show me your word in your Bible, Lord, where I understand it. When you get in there and you just openly communicate with God, it matters so much. But we say, oh, I'm so busy. I, I got so much to do. I got to take my kids. I got to do this. Stop. And my kid says, Daddy, when I do this, it hurts. You know what you do? Stop doing that. I don't have no time. Why don't you have time? You see, our life has to be disciplined. It's not ran by things. We run the things. We're supposed to be in control of it. Can you imagine going a whole day without a smartphone? Can you imagine going a whole day without a computer? See, to serve Christ, to be involved in ministry, it's a privilege. And it's not a privilege of convenience. It's a privilege of serving him no matter what's needed. How's your Christian walk? Do you need to recommit your life to Christ today? Is your life totally centered upon him? Or do you see everything but Jesus? If you could bow your heads for just a moment. As they're coming, they're going to have an altar call song today. And as they're playing, here's the whole altar call. If you examine yourself, not the preacher examine you, not your neighbors or your youngins, but if you say, here I am, Lord, show me, is there something that I need to change? I believe most of us have things that we need to drop. Most of us have things that we need to cut back on and things we need to increase on. It matters in your life, and it matters with your walk with Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, let me tell you, don't leave out here. Don't leave out here without understanding. Jesus loves you. He paid the ultimate price so that you can have salvation. He says if you just ask him to forgive you and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, it makes an eternal difference. Today is a day to answer the questions. Won't you come this morning as they play? These altars are open, these front pews. Won't you come?
GAs here tonight and I would love to see all your smiling beautiful faces support these youngins support the teachers that have uh, brought them to the GA camp and done so much with them it'll be a wonderful blessing I'm gonna tell you you're gonna enjoy it and I just want to invite y'all to come to that tonight let's all stand for our benediction Johnny would you lead us as we pray Thank you. 